And now we turn to a conversation with a trailblazer in journalism. Maria Hinojosa was, de has decades of experience in the news business. She's the host of the nationally syndicated radio show Latino USA and president and CEO of the Futuro Media Group. Ms. Hinojosa was recently in town and sat down with our own correspondent, Russell Contreras, to talk about the representation of Latinos in the media, the current political debate about immigration, and changing identities in the United States. Maria Hinojosa, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. It's great to be here. Um, President Trump has promised to, to build a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. Here in New Mexico, the construction of the wall, uh, some repairs have started, and our current governor has uh, agreed to send some national guard troops down to the border region. Uh, what is this signal you, to you as a journalist of what, what's going on on the issue of immigration? Well, my immediate reaction is it seems that people are not consuming the work that the journalists are doing in kind of uncovering what's really going on with this. I mean, I think about the fact that I was covering the beginnings of the building of that wall in 2006 and 2007, when $28 billion were um, given to uh, Boeing to develop the wall and the cyber wall. $28 billion later, here we are again, 12 years later, talking about a narrative that's a false narrative. All of the data shows that immigration by land from Mexico is basically at zero. So it worries me that the national mainstream media continues to fall into a narrative which is that we should build a wall because it's necessary to protect us and we have to have strong security. Um, the wall has nothing to do with that. The wall um, is a political tool um, that right now is being used by this administration um, as, um, as you know, everybody says, as red meat for his constituents. It just feels terrible that as a journalist, me, you, we've been covering this story for so long, we've been talking about the complexity of all of this for so long, and yet here we are this many years later, right back at zero. So it, it's quite frustrating because it begins to feel that this is not just about a policy um, or a strategic policy decision or even a strategic geopolitical decision. It begins to feel that this is some kind of targeting against people like me who were born in Mexico. Um, and, then, and then it just, we, we're not able to kind of move beyond that and we get stuck. So it feels, it, it feels very stuck. Sadly, it's, it affects people, human beings in very personal ways and that's the part that's difficult. And how do you use Latino USA to help change that narrative around immigration? Well, I, I don't think that that's the only idea behind Latino USA. Latino USA is covering every story about Latino and Latinas that we possibly can. And not all of them revolve around immigration and the wall because we've been here since forever. So it's not just about that. And that's a difficult challenge, right? Because as a journalist, I've been covering immigration for the entirety of my career. So um, I think it's hugely important, but at the same time, there's so much more to who we are. So I think with Latino USA, we add the, we do deep reporting about these issues. We go into the complexity of the story. We present a kind of humanity of the characters behind it. And not only behind the issue of immigration, but behind the story of Latinos and Latinas in this country. So it's not like we're targeting every week the false narrative of immigrants coming from Mexico and Latin America to take over this country. What we're doing is we're simply telling the stories of who we are. And in that sense, I think it allows people to humanize us. But it's almost like in this moment in time, Russ, that we would need to have reporters covering every single day what is happening on that border because it has become like a war zone and we're not able to do that. Now, various studies show that Latino representation in newsrooms are still stuck at 4%, 6%, 8% sometimes in a, in, a, in a more rosy picture. How is that still affecting the coverage of Latinos in the USA with, with this low number of Latino journalists in newsrooms? So the statistic that I repeat um, is that now we have less diversity in our mainstream American newsrooms than before September 11th. And yet our population, just from 2000 to 2010, grew by 45%. So the fact that we have a number that is stuck or is even decreasing in certain places is incredibly frustrating. Um, I mean, everybody watches the news. Most recently, we had a story about 
um, immigrants traveling um, in a caravan for safety reasons. Um, everybody was talking about it. There was a huge issue. The president was sending National Guard troops down because of this. How many of the people in the caravan did we actually hear from? Did we hear their voices? Did we see them? Did we see their children? Did we understand why they were in a caravan in order to protect their lives? So, um, and none of them were coming to break laws and to come in here and force themselves here. So um, that's just one example. I'll give you another one, Russ. You know, recently the Supreme Court upheld the decision that it is legal to hold an immigrant with papers or an immigrant um, without papers, because as you know, there are immigrants with green cards who are being held in immigration detention camps. Um, it is legal, as per the Supreme Court, to hold an immigrant without bond, indefinitely. The only thing that separates um, those people from those people is the fact that they weren't born in this country. I'm one of those people who was not born in this country. I thought that when that news occurred, that it would be above the fold, all caps in the New York Times, the Supreme Court allows immigrants with green cards to be held indefinitely without bond. It's a huge moment in our country. And it was kind of, you know, not on, not on the front page, just a kind of this is what the Supreme Court said and did. Those are the things that really worry me because if we had more diversity in our newsrooms, if we had more people who were immigrants or who had family who were immigrants, they would say, wait a second, what just happened in our United States, in our Supreme Court? We need to look at this. We need to highlight this. This is basic violation of due process simply because they weren't born here. And it just kind of passed. And that's just one example of the ways in which the complexities of the stories of Americans of different backgrounds are not being told. Now, earlier this year, uh, the Albuquerque Journal ran a, an editorial cartoon from a syndicated cartoonist portraying dreamers uh, as connected to MS-13, possible terrorists. Um, there was a lot of reaction here in the community. Um, many people thought it was racist and offensive. What was your reaction to that cartoon? Look, I, I, I worry about silencing all satire because we don't want a society where satire and humor and, um, uh, doesn't exist. But at the same time, there's a problem playing into the narrative that immigrants, um, brown people, um, are the same as all terrorists. That I, it, I, when I saw it, I just looked at it and I was like, first I was like, oh, this is interesting. And then, of course, you turn the corner and you're like, oh, they just said that immigrants are either all gang members or they're members of um, ISIS. Um, and I got disgusted. Uh, I immediately thought, who's the cartoonist who drew this? Who's the cartoonist who had that thought in their mind? And did they think we're gonna push this satire, which I get, but sadly right now the emotions are too raw. And this administration has worked really, really hard at equating all immigrants with criminals. As you know, this administration calls them illegal, illegal aliens, as if all people um, who are immigrants are potential illegal human beings. And now we're criminals too. And as you know, um, you know I, there, there's no such thing as an illegal human being. This is one of my, you know, one of my things. Um, I went viral because I said this on MSNBC. Um, and I didn't learn this from a radical Latino studies professor. I learned not to use the term illegal from Elie Wiesel who survived the Holocaust, may he rest in peace. He was the one who told me never use the term illegal to describe a human being because that's the way the Holocaust started. They declared the Jews to be an illegal people. So um, this, this notion of playing into a narrative that we are criminals because we're immigrants goes against everything that this country stands for. So a lot, because of a lot of cutbacks in the newsroom, because of our coverage of the current administration, uh, international stories are having a hard time making the airwaves on the page and uh, our pages of our newspapers across the country. How is Latino USA um, continuing to try to get those international stories to, to listeners? Well, we, we're a nonprofit organization, so we have to raise a lot of money to do this. Um, and thankfully, we've been able to raise some grants that allow us to go into Latin America. So we have a piece coming up on Latino USA about my return to Medellin 30 years later. Medellin, which everybody thinks of narcos now that that show has been on, um, and everybody thinks that Medellin is a place where Pablo Escobar bombs are going off. And actually, since then, Medellin is one of the most hopeful and innovative cities in the world. 
Um, we're doing an investigative piece into Mexico that's up on Latino USA right now. So we work hard at, we can't cover all of Latin America, but there are certain regions that we are very interested in. And as soon as we are able to raise the funds that allow us to get there, we're covering that story. So we understand that this is, there's, um, there's stories on both sides of the border that we need to understand. You know, Russ, um, I was talking about Central America. Latino USA has been covering Central America for years. Maria Martin did a major series on, um, on Central America for Latino USA. And I was kind of ringing the alarm bells, like the next big area that we need to be watching out for is Central America. Latino USA was covering it and people were like, ho-hum. And here we are all of these year later, years later and not, people not really understanding the complexity of Central America and the United States government's relationship to Central America writ large and how what's happening now is a result of those same policies that now people have seemed to forget. Right. So we, we make a real effort to not forget that history and to bring those connections in. Right. In addition to international coverage, Latin USA does a really good job of incorporating artists and writers into its coverage because it's not just about politics. And you've integrated that into trying to t give us this narrative of the Latino experience uh, in the United States. Why is that important? Because art is the essence of humanity. You know, there's all of this stuff of the, the rough and tumble, the politics, the democracy, you know. But if we didn't have art, where would we be? So for me, I'm married to an artist. Um, his art, Germán Pérez, keeps me alive when I come home from a difficult day at work and I look at his art and I'm like, there's hope, there's esperanza. And I think the way Latino USA covers art and artists is, um, is really authentic. Um, we just had a profile of the poet Jessica Salgado who wrote a love letter to Los Angeles through gentrification. And it's just one poem, but the way that we produced it with music and high production values of Latino USA, it wasn't just a poem. It was, um, it was our understanding of a poet, Salvadoran poet's love for her city that's being gentrified. Um, when we do music, we don't do the predictable music. Um, we just did a profile of Prayers. Um, he's uh, Lea Fair Sayer, who is actually Rafael Reyes backwards. And what he does is um, Cholo Goth. Um, so, you know, Latino USA covering Cholo Goth, covering poets, covering, you know, radical artists. We do this because it's a part and parcel of the Latin American experience. Art is everything. It's an integral part of our lives from our ancestral times. So we have to cover that in the Latino USA of today. And there's so much hope there. I mean, right now, amidst all of the sadness, um, some amazing art is being done. Because in the end, that may be the only thing that we have, is our connection with our own expression, whether it's by painting or whether it's by dancing or whether it's by listening to music. Um, it may be the only thing that gives us hope in certain periods. So I love our arts coverage on Latino USA. In addition to Cholo Goth, you've also had series on, on Latino oldies. So it, it kind of takes us to a different aspect of the community um, across the country. Why is that important to really throw uh, these images and the narrative on his head? Cholo Goth, someone singing 80s music. Uh, why is that so important? Right. We did um, the, the hidden history of Latinos in rock and roll and the hidden history of Latinos in hip hop. Because, you know, part of the problem, Russ, is that um, you know, we still feel invisible as Latinos and Latinas, even though our population is growing and exploding. We're, we've always been here. We're an integral part of, um, of American culture and society and politics, but we're still invisible. So going back and, you know, figuring out that the first guitarist that David Bowie hired was a Puerto Rican, that what we were listening to was a dude getting down on his electric guitar with David Bowie, who was Puerto Rican. The fact that some of the great um, hip hop beginning artists were in the Bronx, Puerto Rican and African Americans working together. So we love to shine a light on that because um, we can't be forgotten. And I still wonder why is it that we somehow become invisible? Um, and whatever it is, whether it's, it's our stories not being told or our own silence, we want to uplift that and simply tell the truth about the fact that we were there with rock and roll, with the 80s, with the oldies, with David Bowie, with hip hop, we were there.
because we've always been here. Thanks for joining us, Maria. It's my pleasure.